Thank you very much, Sven, and thank you to all of you for, uh, for being here today. <clears throat> um, it's always a uh, great treat to uh, kick things off, and uh, one of the things you've got to decide is, is what to talk about. So I thought I'd take it back to as, as basic and fundamental a level as possible. This is, after all, the master investor. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about uh, near-term trading situations. I'm talking about what you should be thinking about if you're an investor. The stuff you need to know and the stuff that, uh, once you know it, will show you where there is opportunity right now and where there is, in fact, great threat. Um, I um, previously wrote a, uh, a book. I, it's a very generous way of putting it. It's only about 5,500 words. Um, for, a, um, for a client, and there's a few copies left over. So at the end, th this incorporates most of what I'm going to talk about. If at the end anyone's interested, uh, I'm going to have a kind of honor system in the corner here. Um, I don't know what it should cost, so you have to pay me what you think, uh, you think it might be worth. So I'm, I'm now going to do some advertising. <laughs> so um, I don't know how many of you here are um, uh, GCSE level uh, Shakespeare scholars like myself. But uh, I seem to remember Mark Antony at some stage standing there to the crowd saying, I come here to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Uh, and what he actually meant was he was going to praise him. Well, I sort of come here to bury bonds, not to praise them. And I mean that quite literally, <laughs> uh, unlike Mark Antony. Um, but I've called it in praise of equities because uh, what I want to do really is, is show how all these different asset classes fit together over time and what we think we know about them. The first thing we're really thinking about is, and, and this is the sort of thing which has uh, beset scholars, particularly of a socialist bent for a long time, is, is about capital and what we think the return on capital is or should be over time and how we can then try and use that for our own investments so that we get, can uh, invest our spare uh, uh, savings and get a decent return or a decent pension pot when it comes time to us needing to live off those savings. If you look at recent advertisements, you can see that what um, some people are, are, are advertising, this is, by the way, is not M&G themselves advertising this. This was in a, in a newspaper, um, and they were just using the M&G fund. So I'm not um, casting any aspersions on M&G. But you can see here, I hope, um, the red line is the M&G optimal fund, and the black line is the FTSE all share over the last five years. And the point they're trying to make uh, implicitly here is that, frankly, you can make as much money in bonds as you can in stocks, even when the stock market's going up. And since bonds are lower risk, why wouldn't you? Now, this is somewhat disingenuous because, uh, in actual fact, the way the financial sector is currently trying to work out what risk is involves uh, incorporating returns. We basically assume something must be lower risk over, if, over the long run, it has a lower return. So the point about this talk is going to be, what if something gives you low risk over time and low return over time, um, but recently has given you a high return? Does that mean it's changed, or does that mean it has to go back to its long-run trend? So here's a, here's, a, here's a common lament that you now hear in the financial markets from anyone whose job it is to invest money in bond funds. They keep getting given money to invest in bond funds, and they can't now find anywhere to go. They're all being crowded into this uh, narrower and narrower space. A little stat for you. Um, at the moment, over 50%, about 53% of the world's bonds yield less than 1%. And there are $5.3 trillion worth of bonds that have negative yields, 60% of which are in Europe. So who on earth is, uh, is, is lending money to people and guaranteeing they'll pay back not only no interest, but less money than you lent to them. And how long can this continue? So if we have a look at the long-run return of such things, you can see that UK gilts um, have returned uh, nearly 7%. Now, this is in real terms. So uh, inflation adjusted, 7% a year over the extensive period of 1981 to 2014. What's really interesting about this period as well is how long it is. Not just how long it is, but specifically how long it is. About 33, running into now the 34th year at the moment. Because for the 35 years preceding that, bonds had a very different relationship. Bonds adjusted for inflation delivered an annual return of minus, nearly minus 3%. So as humans, we're quite good at working on um, 
year-by-year -year movements. Our agrarian ancestors would be quite good at saying, don't fret about the winter too much, it's going to be spring soon. And we're not bad at thinking about relatively long-term things, like telling our children you should really do well in your exams, because otherwise you won't get to university, and we should start doing revision now. But we're not very good at thinking about things that occur over non-human timescales. And so this appears to be a bond cycle that is occurring over something like a 35-year timescale. And what could possibly occur over a 35-year timescale? Well, from an economics point of view, that's much longer than a business cycle. That's about three or four business cycles. But it's pretty much the inflation cycle. We tend to have inflationary and disinflationary periods that last around about that amount of time. And as you'd expect, bonds are related to that. So this is, the, uh, this is the picture of what's been happening in these different markets, bonds and equities, over this time. So the dark blue line is um, the bond yield. And these are, are real bond yields that are adjusted for inflation. And the bond yield has basically come down from a sort of 12% high in the, in the very, very inflationary days, down now to uh, hovering just above zero. And if you look at the FTSE All Share, that's the dividend yield. And you can see that the dividend yield has been remarkably steady. And the thing that's moved between them both is the rate of inflation. I've smoothed the rate of inflation, so that otherwise it's all over the place. But what you can see is that whereas the rate of inflation in the old days used to be uh, right up there, and bond yields were around about the same as the rate of inflation, inflation then fell very fast. And bond investors weren't used to that. So bond yields didn't fall that fast. But after inflation had stayed down for quite a large amount of time, and when most of the scares had turned into nothing, bond investors got quite complacent. They thought inflation isn't something we'll ever have to worry about. In which case, this very low risk instrument of ours, bonds, now seems to be giving us a really good return. We should go for it. But there comes a stage when bond yields fell even below the level of inflation, post the financial crisis, which is where we are now. And throughout this entire period, the dividend yield on equities hasn't really changed. That's a sort of 20-year period where equities haven't really changed. So the feature we find here is that equities are doing what they always do and are looked to be, as we'll see uh, shortly, approximately at the right value. But bonds are not doing what they should do and therefore have to do some radical readjustment over the next uh, um, few years in order to get back in line. And that radical readjustment we've seen historically can be not only very painful in terms of returns, negative returns, but last for a very long period of time. Here, for those of you who uh, um, are fans of Warren Buffett, and who isn't, um, this is basically him describing in as clear a way as he can why the uh, financial industry, who, who have got this concept in their heads that volatility is the same as risk, but we think of risk as being the risk of losing some money, and they're thinking of risk as in the amount that things might move around on their trajectory from A to B, that of course these two things aren't always the same. And if they're not the same, then we might have a very big problem if we've defined an asset bonds as low risk when it's changed over time into something that is really quite high risk. And how would you become high risk over time? Well, you'd perform well. This sounds kind of ironic, but since we originally defined risk as something that's related to performance, if bonds were lower risk than equities because they didn't go up so much, but now bonds have gone up every bit as much as equities, that means they must have become as risky as equities. But they're not managed that way, and none of the people whose jobs are involved in dealing with these things are used to thinking in this way. So here's the long run picture. This is going back 200 years, and obviously um, we have to be a bit suspicious about anything that goes back 200 years, but it's compiled by Jeremy Siegel, who's a very um, um, uh, admired academic at Wharton Business School, um, and he's been doing this for many years. And as you can see, equities here are very volatile. They do have very big down moves. However, they also return back to trend. This is called mean reversion. Mean reversion is an extremely powerful um, uh, force in the world, particularly the world of finance. And it means that equities, although they're volatile, which by terms of those at business school means risky, because they mean revert, in the long run, their returns are also very stable, which means not risky. So in actual fact, you find that depending on exactly how you define risk, and particularly your time frame, um, equities are very risky if you have a very short time frame, if you're a day trader, or, or even someone with a 12-month time frame. But if you've got a 10-plus year time frame, then equities aren't risky.
You just have to be aware of the fact that during that 10 year period, they can be all over the place. What about bonds? Well, here's bonds. I don't know if anyone can actually see the pointer. I'm, I'm bravely, heroically pointing it at the screen, and probably none of you can see it. It's a tiny dot. But um, this red line here is bonds. And bonds, as you can see, since 81, have gone up every bit as fast as equities. But on a 200 year basis, you can see how bizarre that looks. If we'd had a 180 year discussion only 30 years ago, or 170 year, we would have said over the 170 years that bonds and equities have been arrived, bonds have virtually given you no real return at all. They're like other things that give you no real return over time, like houses and gold. They have their spikes, they have their good times, but they also have their down times and their bad times. So this move in bonds is really quite extraordinary. We have seen it before, though. We've seen uh, long-term uptrends in bonds that have lasted uh, decades. But we've also seen periods of bond performance which are actually downward sloping. That means you're getting uh, decades-long downward moves in real terms. So it is not at all unprecedented to be worried about the fact that you might be looking at a period where bonds are actually um, a fantastically dangerous destroyer of your savings. Other things that people uh, obviously talk about, uh, the smaller companies index, all the data we have on smaller companies suggests that smaller companies are like equities, big equities, but even more so. Uh, because less is known about them, because it takes more specialist knowledge, uh, because they've got greater growth opportunities if it goes well, uh, they tend to outperform uh, large uh, stocks, and therefore um, it's very convenient that the next speaker is Gervais Williams, because that chimes in extremely nicely. Since I'll be channeling you towards what must be the best asset class, then you've got an expert in that asset class uh, persuading you to buy uh, his fund too. And we don't really know about um, uh, commercial real estate, not on these sorts of long time frames we're talking about. This is the IPD commercial real estate uh, sector. It hasn't really been going long enough, but it does seem to move quite closely with small cap. So it looks like it's a pretty high return uh, sector. And again, that would make sense. It's fairly uh, illiquid in terms of the specific buildings. The returns are quite high. Unlike housing, where people factor in an awful lot into the, the buying price because they just like the house or it's handy for work, uh, commercial buildings tend to be done with a much more hard-nosed way. So we think we know what we're talking about here. We think, using the longer-term data, that equities do well, that they do better than bonds, that bonds do better than cash or uh, short-term uh, securities, uh, and that cash, funnily enough, in the long run, doesn't do much different to gold. The gold bugs tell you about gold versus cash, but they forget to mention that the cash they're measuring is not invested in the bank uh, and earning interest over time. And of course, even as a kid, I had a post office savings account, so that's kind of unrealistic. So if we actually have a look at, um, at the performance we expect to get from things, this is the return since um, uh, 1899. Uh, I'm using the last 100 years data here because uh, it's very, very similar to the 200 year data. But we can probably be more um, sure that it's more accurate, because it gets harder to measure data when we go further back into time. And what you can see here is that, generally speaking, um, the US returns are about 1% uh, higher than UK returns. This is almost definitely because it turns out there's a mistake in the way they measure RPI in the UK, which is the only long-term inflation measure we have. And it's the reason they're going to start um, phasing RPI out, and possibly might stop doing it altogether. But there's a, there's a there's a weird uh, mathematical oddity in its composition, which leads to it to overstate inflation over time. Um, and so we can see that operating here. So I don't think that this actually suggests that US uh, equities or bonds do better than UK ones, just that we're not measuring um, the, the deflator the same in the two different countries. But the thing I really want to draw your attention to is that um, you should get the best performance, uh, eight, maybe 9% uh, real long run um, total re returns uh, with um, dividends reinvested, so not putting the pressure on Gervais here at all, um, in smaller companies. With larger equities, you should get 6 to 6.5% if you measure your inflation properly. And with um, long bond yields, you get, you get a better return from the long bond than you do from the, uh, the shorter term uh, debt instruments. You should be getting something like 2 to 2.5%. That's what you should expect to get. So if we have a look at what's happened in the last 30, 34 years, what do we find? Everything's pretty much in line with what you'd expect. Smaller companies have given us our 8%. Uh, larger companies have given us sort of 7, 7.5%, which is no, not too different to their 6, 6.5% long run average. Uh, 
But look at this. Instead of getting 2, 2.5%, we've been getting, uh, adjusted for inflation, more like 8%. And we've been getting that steadily for 30, 33 years. Now, that's great until it ends. And as we've seen from the past, when these things end, they then tend to be 30 or 35 years going in the opposite direction. So we have seem to be at very much at the mature end of it. Even if you weren't looking at negative yields on bonds, you'd be thinking we're very much at the mature end of this uh, move. And here it is on the UK. This is uh, the real return of equities. Again, you can see um, that you do get these, uh, these big downward moves. So equities are volatile. But as long as you're not buying it visibly one of the peaks, in the long run, if you're investing, you should get a much better return, a much better recompense for the risk you're taking with equities. But if you have a look at gilts, gilts in the long run, we're talking here 100 years, gilts in real terms, when we shake out the, uh, the downturns, these are um, sums done by Barclays, <coughs> which may be slightly different to Jeremy Siegel's, but we're really not getting much of a return at all. And so what you have to think of when you've got something that, that can have a big drop, come back to flat, big drop, come back to flat, that a good run in bonds is a very bad sign when we're then thinking about what might happen further down the line. So how do I create um, inflation? Well, the best way to create, create inflation is by missetting my interest rates compared to the level of nominal GDP. So here I've got a chart just showing you smooth curves of, uh, in the UK, GDP and the Bank of England base rate. And this dark blue line is the rate of nominal GDP growth. And as you can see, when the Bank of England keeps the, the uh, interest rate at a lower level than the level of nominal GDP growth, that is too stimulative and inflation starts to race away. And then when they take the level of uh, base rates to a higher level compared to nominal GDP, then we suddenly get, or we do, suddenly we, with a bit of a lag, we get this downturn uh, and a disinflationary period. And you'll notice that the 30 year period where bonds were underperforming equates perfectly to the period where we had inflation, i.e., where interest rates were too low and lower than the level of nominal GDP growth. Then bonds performed fantastically from 1981, which is about here onwards, because uh, during that period we had interest rate policy which had that interest rates were slightly higher than the level of nominal GDP. That put the, uh, the lid on inflationary pressures and brought our inflation levels down from the sort of 12, 15% levels to the five and sub five to now nearly, well, we're now at zero uh, inflation levels. But look what's happened just recently. As a consequence of the crisis, we now have interest rates which are well below the level of nominal economic activity. Now, this isn't immediately an issue, which is inflationary, because the banks aren't passing that low interest rate on. But as the system cures itself, and it is now cured in America, by all intents and purposes, then we'll start to find that this is now quite an inflationary environment, or interest rates have to rise. Either of those scenarios is deadly to bonds. So as I said before, um, when the interest rate is, is higher, uh, than the level of economic activity or lower, that determines whether you have an inflationary period or not. And this chart just shows you that when interest rates were lower than the level of economic activity, the rate of inflation, which is this purple line here, RPI, was going up. And then from 81 or so onwards, RPI then comes down because we've flipped, well, the Bank of England had flipped that. So we sort of know what, on a long-term basis, we should expect in terms of performance. We sort of know whether it should be inflationary or not. We sort of know whether bonds have had a, a growth spurt that they can't possibly sustain. Um, so we're looking now at where we should park our money, and it's starting to fall into place. It's starting to fall into place that you really, if you're looking at investing, you want to always uh, and everywhere um, have your money, if you're taking a long-term approach, in equities, because the mean reversion makes the return stable over time, and maybe particularly in smaller uh, cap equities, and maybe particularly with uh, an international exposure, so you're hedged on a currency basis. And we don't particularly want to have too much money in bonds because they don't give you a return, except they have recently. And the fact that they've given you this fantastic return recently is actually very much a danger signal. So now I'm just going to spend the last couple of slides looking at bonds themselves. Bonds at the moment, this is the spread on bonds. The dotted lines are high yield bonds, and the solid lines are investment grade bonds. Every time there's a scare, what you find is that the high yield bonds panic that maybe um, there's going to be a massive amount of defaults, 
and the yield spike. So this is only going back to the year 2000. We've already had two substantial um, high yield bond panics. So bonds are long overdue another bit of panic. You get the, the high performance uh, when everyone's been complacent. The problem is that the regulatory changes at the banks mean that the banks now don't have the ability to deal with any of these panics. This is a chart showing you the primary dealer inventories in the US. Now these are the big investment banks in the US who have been given the right to handle um, the sales of, of new US treasury, i.e. government debt uh, issuance. And these guys used to have quite a big book of inventories so that people would come to them and say, I want to buy this or sell that. And they'd say, well, I'll bid you this or I'll offer you that. And they would be able to, the traders would be able to have some flexibility. And the regulators come along and said, we don't like you banks doing stuff in areas we don't understand. So we want to start uh, putting capital costs on this, which means the banks are going, well, in that case, we better close that down. So look what's happened to the level of dealer inventories. They were up here at, uh, I, think this is, uh, I think this is expressed in, um, in dollars, billion. So this is $225 billion worth of inventory. Now we're down at more like about $25 billion. So we've seen something like an 80% plus drop in inventories. That means next time there's a shakeout in bonds, when the guys all run to the banks and say, what's your price in? The bank will say, my price in everything is zero. I can't buy any. You know, I'm, I've hit my limits this morning before coffee. And I can't do anything to help you out. So if you actually look at the rolling turnover of bonds, the turnover of uh, investment grade bonds as a percentage of um, their outstanding used to be in a year over 100%. But that was already being squeezed. This is as we go into the crisis here. This is the crisis low, down at just over 70%. Some sort of recovery, and then the regulators kick in and say to the banks, no, you can't be doing this. We are now at a situation in a non-stressed environment where there isn't anything wrong going on in bonds, quite the opposite, where the level of turnover in investment grade, this is the top quality bonds, is now lower than it was in the panicked bottom of the crisis when the bankers were all running for cover. So what is going to happen next time we have to run for cover and there's a panic? The illiquidity could be unprecedented. So we've got a situation where bonds are massively dangerous on a long-term basis. We're ready temporarily and in terms of the fundamentals to turn that around. There's no capacity in the system to deal with a big shakeout for bonds. Um, and so this is all a long-winded way of saying, in that case, I'm talking in praise of equities without having hardly mentioned equities at all. Uh, and as I said, the best place within equities to be is a small cap, so it couldn't be better than if I hand over to Gervais. Well, I'm not sure I'm handing over to Gervais just this second. I believe there might be a, a bit of a gap um, for coffees and stuff. But the next talk should be unmissable, I hope, uh, after what I've had to say. So the final thing to bear in mind, if you think I'm just kind of rabble-rousing and, and, and stirring up, this chart comes from the pro-cyclicality group at the Bank of England. They got a little bit worried that maybe one running around telling all the investors where to put their money as a regulator um, wasn't such a good idea. What if we're telling everyone to put them in low risk things and the low risk stuff isn't actually low risk? So they had a quick look at where the money's gone. Back in 1987, 55% of UK pension fund and insurance companies' assets were in domestic equities, more than half. Even at the turn of the century, about half of all their assets, this is the dark blue block here, we're in domestic UK equities. Now, it's about 4%. This is, this is almost unprecedented. The only massive move in, in financial companies' behavior that's been triggered by regulators of a similar magnitude I've ever seen is the uh, amount and speed with which banks uh, increased leverage after Basel II, which was directly responsible for the financial crash. So we have a regulator who has form in causing crashes and not admitting it afterwards. Um, and here we have regulatory inspired behavior that has chased the institutions out of equities and forced them into bonds, where bonds now are yielding negative amounts. There's no capacity in the system to bail people out of bonds. It could not be more dangerous. So as I said, um, stay in places where, relatively speaking, it's less dangerous, like little old small cap Gervais. Williams Equities. Anyway, that's my, my piece, and you must read the disclaimer. Oh, and by the way, um, it's sort of more of an experiment than anything else, but um, I've got a few copies of this um, booklet, which I wrote for a company called THS, uh, which covers very much these sorts of uh, territories, and I wasn't sure what to do with them, so I've got them over here in the corner.
I have no idea what price they should be, so um, they're available to anyone for whatever price you deem is um, fair. I wish to warn you, there's only about five and a half thousand words, so it's, it looks like a book, but it isn't really. Thank you very much.